Well, we're in Vayeki. We're in uh, Genesis 47, 29. Jacob's calling for his son, Joseph. Because he wants to have Joseph fulfill his sort of a last will and testament here to be buried in the land of Israel. And we, uh, the Midrash is currently just, we, we left off last week, the Midrash just asked the question, why does everyone want to be buried in the land of Israel? And we said that Rabbi Elazar said it's for a good reason. Rabbi Hanania said, yes, yeah, for a good reason. Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi said, yes, yeah, for a good reason. And the Midrash says, what was the good reason? So the answer is, oh. we left off last week at this cliffhanger where uh, we're trying to figure out why. Why does everyone want to be buried in the land of Israel? The Midrash continues answering the question with Psalm 116, 9. I will walk before Hashem in the land of the living. Because now it's got to explain what that means. Our rabbis of blessed memory said two things. One, the name of Rabbi Chalavo. Why did the forefathers cherish burial in the land of Israel? Because the dead in the land of Israel will be the first to be resurrected in the days of Mashiach. Does anyone ever hear that? The dead in the land of Israel will be the first to be resurrected in the days of Mashiach. We always imagined it, probably growing up, where there's a young Christian and everyone comes back at once. Or if you studied a little bit more, you would know that there's two times where a lot of people come back, assumedly at once. But you have the first resurrection, this is all in Revelation, you have the first resurrection, where the good guys all come back and they, they, they reign, they, you know, Jesus comes with the myriads of his saints and then, uh, you know, he conquers the world and there's the messianic era, which is a thousand years. And then after that, there's another resurrection. Everybody else comes back and then they get uh, judged. Well, the, the one verse says that the dead in Christ will rise first and then those who are alive will go up. Yeah, yeah. Is that why Israel, are they dead in Christ? That's a good question. That's a good question. Will um, Jewish people who didn't believe in Jesus be some of the people coming back at the first resurrection? Good question. So um, <laughs> the rabbis say that these, uh, the rabbis certainly think they will. We're in Midrash Tenkuma. We can answer from Midrash Tenkuma. Midrash Tenkuma said, of course, yeah. Um, certainly they will. And interestingly, um, in Matthew, at the, toward the end of Matthew, when Jesus um, dies, the moment he dies, Matthew is the only one who records this. Many, there's a big earthquake, and many graves pop open, and holy men come out, and were seen by many. He's got one little verse of this weird thing doesn't show up in any of the Gospels. Paul never talks about it, um, but obviously these are all Jews. And this was so, but these are not. This wasn't the first resurrection because Jesus is the first one who comes back permanently and never has to die again so these guys all died again but the fact that these guys all came back from the dead the moment jesus died this is sort of as a sign that the uh, that uh, of what's to come a taste of what's coming you know yeah these guys these are oh, they'll probably all be raised in the first resurrection why not hey jacob yeah i i'll take say this real quick it i was continuing the study this morning for the torah club lesson today and right i don't remember i won't look it up they made a statement about something about like this about um, oh the 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 Jeremiah or Zechariah passage about striking down the shepherd and the sheep uh, will scatter yeah and he calls him his fellow which is like calling him his shepherd and then God's shepherd is the king of Israel mm -hmm. and I thought it just occurred to me remember how you've talked about God designated agents over certain as you know over principality over certain areas and yeah. i hope i'm not saying something heretical but what if that one that is supposed to be over israel is that that messiah so um the hierarchy for israel looks a little different because there's no heavenly agent god rules israel directly that's the that's what the thing that's unique about Israel. 
Um, you know, God's the God of everybody, but he, according to this, this broad Jewish tradition of angelology or whatever, he rules the nations through these heavenly agents. And, you know, you read Maimonides or Nachmanides, and they talk about how the, the, the error of idolatry is people worship those agents instead of the one um, God. But Israel doesn't have an agent. Um, however, you, I think you're probably right in saying that the king of Israel is sort of something similar to that in, in, in the sense that he's called the son of God in Psalm 2, um, and of course in the New Testament. And there is, but, uh, you know, Dan's going to go on to explain in tour club, or maybe he already has, I can't remember where you guys are at. And um, that's what well, it he, he, it's during the, the farewell discourse in John, where Jesus says, uh, he talks about prayer. He says, ask anything you want in my name. And Dan clarifies in the tour club workbook. It doesn't mean you ask, um, you ask and then hope that like your prayers go through him. Like you ask him, like, hey, go ask God for me. You pray directly to God. Jesus isn't like uh, in between us and God, although he's like alongside us, asking with us and saying, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, help, help out my boy here or my girl. But um, yeah, Israel, Israel, but Israel doesn't have a heavenly ruler that's not God or that's in, that's in between them and God in some way. According, according to Jewish tradition. All right. So the reason I connect this idea of wanting to be buried in the land of Israel because you get to be the, one of the first to be the, uh, resurrected is that according to Revelation, that people who rise in the first resurrection uh, experience the Messianic era. Everyone who doesn't come back in the first resurrection or who's not alive at that time doesn't get to experience the Messianic era. They, they stay dead for another thousand years. Um, and what Rabbi Halaba says here is, the dead in the land of Israel will be the first to be resurrected in the days of Messiah, and they will eat in the Messianic era, meaning they'll experience the Messianic era. The, the uh, sort of proof by omission here is that other people, people who are not buried in the land of Israel, won't experience the Messianic era. Then we have another opinion, which I think might be a little bit better because there's lots of people that, you know, I mean, if you die at sea or if you're buried somewhere else because you, know, you didn't have a choice where you lived and where you died. Rabbi Hanania has another idea. Rabbi Hanania says, whoever dies outside the land of Israel and, it's, and it is buried outside the land of Israel experiences two deaths. For it is written, and you, Pashchur, and all the members of your household will go into captivity and come to Babylon, and there you will die, and there you will be buried. It's Jeremiah 20. And the point is, obviously, you know, you die and you're buried. Everyone who's, it's normal to die and then be buried. Why is it mentioned both? It's because it's saying that there's two tragedies there. There's the death and there's the burial in the wrong place. So it's like suffering two deaths. Therefore, Jacob said, do not bury me in Egypt. Rabbi Simona has an answer to that. He says, if so, the righteous ones who are buried outside the land of Israel have lost out. So Rabbi Simona has a solution to our problem. He says, so what will the Holy One blessed as he do? He will make for them underground tunnels in the earth. And he'll make them like caves. And they'll roll until they reach the land of Israel. And once they reach the land of Israel, the Holy One blessed as he will imbue them with the spirit of life and they will stand up. As it is stated, I'm going to raise you up from your graves, my people, and I will bring you to Admat Israel. Or Admat Israel. Their pronunciation is not good. Admat Israel is the soil of Israel, the dirt of Israel, the land, literally speaking, the land, the dirt, the soil of Israel. That's a, a prophecy from Ezekiel 37. And it looks like it says, uh, it, it looks like what it means is that after the resurrection, Jewish people will be gathered into the land of Israel. Um, but if you read, a, if you read I guess, further on, two verses later, so Ezekiel 37, 12 says, I'll bring you to the Admat Israel. Two verses later, verse 14, it says, I'll put my spirit in you and you'll come to life. So Rabbi Simone takes this literally. He says, first he brings them to the land underground, and then he brings them back to life in the land of Israel. 
starting to sound like the only people who come back from the dead are going to come back from the dead in the land of Israel. But if you're not there, you get to tunnel uh, through the ground to get there. Um, other places that, that uh, expand a little bit more on this idea say, well, you still want to be buried in the land of Israel because it hurts to tunnel through the ground. You don't want to. It's uncomfortable. Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish says, it is an explicit verse that as soon as they reach the land of Israel, the Holy One, blessed is he, will imbue a soul within them. As it is stated in Isaiah 42, 5, who gives a soul, is talking about God, who gives a soul to the people upon it and a spirit to those who walk on it. It there in, the, in Isaiah is Aretz, which sometimes means the whole planet, all the land. Right in Genesis 1, God created a Shemayim with Aretz. It's all of it, all the arts, all the all the arets, all the land. But uh Shimon Malaki seems to think that this is talking only about Eretz, Israel. Sometimes Aretz or Eretz in the Bible is interpreted as meaning the land of Israel, Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. It seems to be what he's saying here. Once you're on the land of Israel, you get your soul back or your spirit back, um, and you can be raised from the dead. The story is told of Rebbe. That's Rebbe again is Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. He's the, the Judah the Prince, leader of the Jewish people around this, the end of the second uh, century, redactor of the Mishnah, the first um, code of the Jewish oral law that was written down. Famous, famous guy. Rebbe and Rabbi Elazar were walking in Pile, which is outside of Tiberias. You don't want to go inside Tiberias. And they saw a casket. <clears throat> Bearing a dead person coming from outside the land of Israel to be buried in the land of Israel. Rebbe said to Rabbi Elazar, What benefit is there for this guy, you know, one whose soul departed outside the land of Israel and comes to be buried in the land of Israel? The commentary clarifies the Rebbe knew this guy, and the guy could have moved back to Israel and lived in Israel. And then the Lakar says, You're supposed to, if you're Jewish, you're supposed to live in the land of Israel if you can. And if you're there, you're not really supposed to leave or like move out of the land of Israel. It's a mitzvah to live in the land of Israel as a Jewish person. So this guy, Rebbe is like, this guy should have come back while he was alive. Why did he wait, wait till after he's dead? Rebbe says, I attribute to him the verse, and you made my inheritance into an abomination. This is Jeremiah 2, verse 7. During your lifetime, you don't come up. It's uh, coming up is a, is, a, is a metaphor for um, coming to the land of Israel. It doesn't matter your actual elevation. You go to the land of Israel, you're going up. Because you're going up to a higher level of holiness. Going to Israel, a Jewish person going to Israel today is called, is called making Aliyah. Which is the, it's the same root as the burnt offering because the smoke rises. So it's the same root as means going up, going up. Uh, Aliyah is going up, going up to the land of Israel. So Re Rebbe says, during your lifetime, you didn't come up. But now you come and defile my lands. It's the same verse, Jeremiah 2, 7. You defile my land in your death. So Rebbe's mad. Rebbe, some, Rebbe sometimes got a temper. He had a toothache for 13 years. We'll, we'll read about that later. <laughs> Rebbe, uh, Rebbe uh, is upset that this guy did not come to, to, the, to Israel while he was alive like he should have. And he considers this a fruitless endeavor to be buried in the land of Israel. But Rabbi Elazar, Rabbi Elazar says, hold on, hold on. once he's buried, once he's buried in the land of Israel, the Holy One blessed is he atones for him. As it says in Deuteronomy 32, 43, and he will appease his land, his people. So God is going to appease the land, which maybe is upset that this guy was not living there. Then we get another story about um, dying and resurrection. When Rabbi Yochanan was about to depart the world, he instructed those who were going to take care of his burial, bury me in colorful garments, not white garments or black garments. For if I stand up in the resurrection of the dead among the righteous, I will not be embarrassed. And if I stand up among the wicked, I will not be embarrassed. So there's a couple things you got to know here. One is that, again, in 
Jewish thought, you come back from the dead wearing the same clothes that you were buried in. If you're buried in white garments, you'll come back in white garments. Buried in black garments, you'll come back in black garments. <coughs> Another idea is that righteous people were married, buried in white garments and not righteous people were buried in black garments. So you'll be able to tell easily in the resurrection what people thought of you by the clothes that they put on you after you died. <coughs> So Rabbi Yochanan is not sure whether he's going to be accounted among the righteous or among the wicked. He doesn't want to stand out uh, in a particular, he, he's going to stand out, he's going to stand out wearing those colorful garments, the garments of the person who's unsure. Um, but he doesn't want to be wearing black in, amongst a bunch of uh, people clothed in white. He doesn't want to, really doesn't want to be wearing white amongst a bunch of people clothed in black because that'd be really embarrassing. So he's going to, he wants something different than either of those colors. When Rabbi Yoshio was about to depart the world, he said to the ones standing over him, summon my disciples to me. He said to them, bury me in white garments. I got nothing to be afraid of. The story is told that when the saintly Rebbe, again, same guy, Judah Hanasi, Yehuda Hanasi, Judah the prince, the director of the Mishnah, was about to depart the world, he issued three instructions. First instruction, don't remove my widow from my house. So why would they remove his widow from us? He's the he's the he's the best Jew alive currently. He's like the Gedolador. He's the he's like the, the most famous Jew of his generation, the leader of, 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 of Judaism. Why would they kick his widow out of his house? Well, usually the Nasi or the leader of the, the Jewish people um, lived in like council housing or lived in like publicly funded housing because he was the Nasi. After he dies, someone else is gonna be the Nasi and they're gonna get that house. However, we know that uh, Yehud Hanasi owned his own house. So the Mishnah is reminding, or the uh, Midrash is reminding us, I guess, that um, or, or he's reminding everyone else that he didn't, he never got public funding. He, he never took any funds from the, the, the public um, to support himself. So his, he just owned his house outright. And um, so, she, she should get to stay in it. Second request, do not eulogize me in the cities of the land of Israel. Now this, there's a few words in uh, Hebrew for a bunch of people living together in one place. There's villages, there's cities, and there's walled cities. Walled cities are the big ones. The, the, and, and this is not the word for those. This is a word for smaller cities that are not walled. And the commentary explains that these cities these smaller cities wouldn't be able to handle big crowds without inconveniencing the residents of the city. So he didn't want to cause commotions in these smaller cities. In this last one, which is disputed, some the, the Gemara the, dis, dis, disagrees with this. He says, don't allow any Gentiles to touch my beer. It's not B-E-E-R, it's B-I-E-R. This is the platform on which the coffin rests during the funeral procession. Is rather the one who cared for me during my life shall care for me in death. <clears throat> during his life, he lived in Sipori for 17 years. And he, re he remarked concerning himself, Yaakov lived in the land of Egypt for 17 years. So too did Yehuda live in Sipori. His, his name is Yehuda. Live in Sipori for 17 years. I don't know where, where Sipori is. I should have looked that up. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's not where he wanted to live. Is it outside the land of Israel? I'm not sure. Our saintly Rebbe suffered from a toothache for 13 years. And during those 13 years, no childbearing woman ever died in the land of Israel. Neither did any pregnant, pregnant woman in the land of Israel miscarry. What does this have to do with each other? Why would uh, Yehuda Hanasi having a toothache, what would that have to do with with pregnant women dying in childbirth or miscarrying. Anyone want to guess? <laughs> you should have learned the answer to this in Torah club at some point. And then uh, Jesus, my rabbi, if you're paying attention. One uh, righteous person can suffer for everyone else. Yeah, one righteous person can suffer for everyone else. Basically nailed it. So a person who suffers unjustly, the, the scales have to be balanced somehow. Someone else who was supposed to suffer can not suffer. 
So this, now was this just a really bad toothache or was Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi just an incredibly holy person? Maybe either one, maybe both. It's the same principle as Jesus dying for his sins. Jesus didn't deserve to die because he was perfectly holy and righteous. And as he suffered, you know, his even on the cross, his suffering, he, he, he didn't accept the, the, the gall, the myrrh, and the sponge because he wanted to make sure he experienced all of the suffering. He didn't want wine with painkillers in it or whatever that was. He wanted to experience all the suffering because there's... The more he suffered, the more merit he acquired with God, extra merit, and the more he'd have to share with everyone else. And so we're saved because of that. We have we, we just borrow his righteousness, his extra merit that he earned by being perfect and suffering and dying unjustly. Same principle here. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi had a toothache, and that his suffering was enough to, to tip the scales such that he earned uh, uh, perfectly healthy pregnancies for every single woman in the land of Israel for 13 years. But at the end of those 13 years, Rebbe became angry with Rabbi Chia Hagadol. Rabbi Chia has come up before. Eliyahu, a blessed memory, it's Elijah. Sorry, sometimes I do these Hebrew pronunciations. These are, these are all transliterated according to a more traditional Jewish like Hebrew pronunciation. Um, this is Elijah. Eliyahu is Elijah. Eliyahu, a blessed memory, went to Rebbe pretending to be Rabbi Chia. He changed his appearance to that of Rabbi Chia. First, that's kind of interesting that <coughs> Eliyahu can do this. He was already dead. Right? No, Eliyahu didn't die, remember? Oh, I mean, he was taken. He was taken, yeah, yeah. he was transformed. Oh. Eliyahu apparently has this power to, to, to appear as someone else. It makes you think, will we all be able to do that? Will we all be able to look however we want? Maybe, Maybe. I don't know. Eli yeah, it's neat. <laughs> um, Eliyahu, blessed memory, went into Rabbi, appearing as Rabbi Chia, placed his hand upon his tooth, immediately healing him. The next day, Rabbi Chia, actual Rabbi Chia, came in to visit him. He said, how's your tooth, buddy? And he said, Rabbi, how's your tooth? <clears throat> and uh, Yehud Hanasi says, ever since you placed your hand on it yesterday, it's been healed. Thereupon, Rabbi Chia said, Woe for you, all you childbearing women in the land of Israel. Woe for you, all you pregnant women in the land of Israel. Rabbi Chia said to him, it was not I who placed my hand on your tooth. Rabbi realized it had been Elijah of blessed memory. From that time on, he began to treat Rabbi Chia with respect. <clears throat> now it goes back to the, the Genesis narrative. Jacob is asking Joseph, let me lie with my fathers. The Midrash expands on what Jacob said. Jacob said to Joseph, if you don't, or if you do what I'm asking you to do, everything's going to be fine. But if you say no, I'm going to die right now. My soul is going to depart immediately. So Joseph said, I will, I will do this for you. Jacob said, swear to me. And he swore to him. Back in Genesis 47, 31. Then Israel prostrated himself to the divine presence. <clears throat> um, when he departed what is written there his sons did for him as he commanded this is Genesis 50 verse 12 it's just skipping ahead to tell it's just telling us it's not going to linger there it's just he's Midrash is telling us that he got what he wanted the holy one blessed is he said in this world death does not allow anyone to be happy but in the world to come Isaiah 25 8 says if God's going to eliminate death forever. Once death is eliminated, Isaiah 65, 19 says, I will rejoice over Jerusalem and exult with my people, and they will no longer be heard in it, the sound of weeping and the sound of outcry. This is the world to come. This is the world to come. Not the Messianic era. The Bible says people will die in the Messianic era. Not the people who came back in the first resurrection, but other people, regular people, will still be dying in the Messianic era. They'll live a lot longer, but there'll still be death once in a while in the Messianic era. We talked about this many, many weeks ago. We talked about accidental death in the Messianic era. Why, why, why do you need uh, more cities of refuge in the Messianic era? Because sometimes people will accidentally kill each other because sometimes there will still be death in the Messianic era. Not as much, but some. 
So this is the world to come. It will no longer be heard the sound of weeping and outcry. Death will be eliminated. This is in the last part of Revelation. We see the same thing. The last enemy to, to be defeated is death. Death and Hades are thrown to the, to the lake of fire and so forth. Next section. 25 minutes and all we did was finish this with the one we started last week. Some of these are a lot longer than the other ones. We're in Genesis 48.1, everybody. It's told to Joseph, your father is ill. We're, we're, we're going to get a little halacha here. Teach us our rabbi. Maybe I'll, I'll let you guys guess this one. You should know the answer to this halakhic question by now. We've done enough, enough of these that are similar. Teach us our rabbi. Is one permitted to recite a blessing over the lamp and spices of the dead? To, just to explain before I help, have your answer. The lamp of the dead. Um, you, traditionally in Judaism, you'd light a candle next to uh, uh, someone who is deceased. And you read Psalms in front of them. You read, you read Psalms to them to comfort their souls. Their souls hanging around, right? Kabbalistic ideas, their soul hangs around for three days before it actually goes all the way to uh, where, it, where it's going. So, but they're confused and they're hoping to come back. They're trying to get back into the body. And the reason it takes three days because they see it's beginning to depose, decompose. They realize what's happening and they um then they finally go i mean what would you think if you saw your body lying there you'd be like well it should be in there you would be confused <clears throat> memories uh you know you maybe you wouldn't remember that you that you died right i mean where memories are stored in the hippocampus so your brain's dead what are you you're you all you you're more instinctual that's that's me i'm supposed to be in there i don't know anyway so you light a candle and you recite psalms to comfort the deceased, the soul of the deceased, that for all we know is hanging around, uh, confused. And the, the sound of, of hearing the Tehillim, the psalms read, is comforting. So there's, that's the lamp of the dead. What are the spices of the dead? We all know it's from the Gospels. You, you perfume the, you know, there's, there's spices and whatever that you put on the deceased um, to counteract the smell of a dead person. So is it permitted to recite a blessing over the lamp and spices of the dead? What do you think? Yeah. No. Why not? <laughs> when do you recite a blessing? When someone's For something you receive? For something you, for when you derive benefit from the world. The lamp and the spices... You don't derive, you're not deriving benefit from them. You don't, the spices aren't there for you to smell and think, oh, how delicious the spices smell. The lamp is not there for you. It's for the dead person. So you don't. The rabbis taught us what is not permitted to recite a blessing over a flame or spices of the dead. Now they give a, a more oblique reason. Is what's the reason for it is stated, neither can the dead praise God. The, what, what it's what it's say exactly what the, what it's saying there without without all of it without without spelling it out is that th those things are for the benefit of the dead person. Mm. They're the ones who should be saying the bracha, but the dead person apparently is not permitted to say a bracha because the <laughs> Psalm one fifteen says, uh, seventeen says neither can the dead praise God. Um, Rabbi Meir said, the deceased of idolaters are considered as dead, but the deceased of Israel are not considered as dead. For in their merits, the living remain living. For you will find that when Israel committed that deed, what's the big sin Israel committed that they don't say what it is if they don't have to? Uh, golden calf. Yeah, golden calf. Very good. You're doing well today. We're all doing well today. <laughs> you get an eight today. Yeah. <laughs> Right, because uh, there's a tradition that the children of Israel are still being punished for the sin of the golden calf. And so you don't want to remind God that it happened by saying it out loud, so to speak. God knows everything all the time, but you don't you don't want to speak about it because words have the power, right? Words have power. words spoken out loud have power. So when Israel committed that deed, if it were not for the fact that Moses recalled the merit of the patriarchs, the children of Israel would have perished from the world. We all know this, we all read this Genesis 32, where Moses says, Remember. Abraham, Isaac, and in Israel, Israel, your servants. That's, that was Moses' argument to God, to not destroy the children of Israel. Remember the patriarchs. Therefore, it is difficult, as it were, for the Holy One, blessed is he, to decree death against the righteous. We actually have this right in the Psalms, Psalm 116, 15. It says, in the eyes of Hashem, the death of his pious ones is difficult. God doesn't want to... 
take the life, reap the life of someone who's righteous. So what does he do? He shows them their reward so that they verbally demand death. The, uh, there's an analogy here in, the, in, the, in a footnote to the laws of fruit bearing trees, which I think is really interesting. To lock around a fruit bearing trees, you're not allowed to cut down a fruit bearing tree. So fruit bearing trees are very useful provide food and you can't destroy or waste a useful thing in, in Judaism. It's, it's forbidden based on actually the, the passages about cutting down trees. It's forbidden to waste food. It's forbidden to destroy something that's useful in Judaism. Um, so you can't cut down a fruit tree, uh, but, you, but you can if the wood that you would get from cutting it down is worth more than all the fruit it's going to produce. Maybe toward the end of its life, fruit trees are less productive, and you might find that you can get you can make more use out of the wood than you would uh, get from letting the fruit tree continue to attempt to bear fruit. So, a righteous person who, uh, you know, may, maybe if for for most of their life, if they keep living longer, they'll get more reward in the, in the world to come. But at a certain point, it's time because the the it's the ideal time because. Uh, they they will gain more by dying than by living longer. So God, in, at, at that time, God shows a righteous person their reward so that they demand death. And once they demand death, God is not as difficult for God to give them death. It gives the example of Rabbi Abahu. Rabbi Abahu is about to die. The Holy One, blessed is he, showed him his reward. He asked in surprise, is this all for Abahu? What did he get? 13 rivers, I think, is what he got. Those are probably figurative for something. I don't know. He said of himself, and I said, I have toiled for nothing and used up my strength for nothingness and vanity. However, my judgment is with Hashem. It's a quote from Isaiah 49. It sounds like he sees his reward and it's like, I, all that work for nothing. I just got 13 rivers. What it means is, in context here, is... Uh, all his life, he said to himself, I'm toiling for nothing. In other words, he followed. Perkeva 1.3, Rintinus of Soho said, don't serve God like one who works expecting a reward. Serve God like one who works without expecting a reward. So Rabbi Abahu said, all my life, I, I toiled not expecting a reward. A reward. And, but he was certainly very happy to see these 13 rivers. 13 from the word of uh, the word of Hava, um, love is a numeric value of 13. In other words, everything he did, he did out of love for God and not because he wanted to get something from God. Rabbi Abahu sees these 13 rivers, he immediately yearns for death. And then what about Abraham? Abraham verbally demanded death for in Genesis 15, 2, he says, since I'm going to leave this world childless, and therefore, God said to him uh, in uh, verse 15 of the same chapter, that he would come to his ancestors in peace. Isaac demanded death. I mean, he wants to bless Esau in the presence of God before he dies, Genesis 27. Jacob demanded death when he sees Joseph. He says, now I can die. And the Holy One, blessed is he, said, well, you say that, but you're going to live for another 17 years. All right, Genesis 48, one. it happened after these events. It happened after these events. Israel's death through Nehemiah called for his son, for Joseph. He's going to bless Ephraim and Manasseh, if I remember correctly. In reference to this, the verse states, for his blessed ones shall inherit the earth, while his accursed ones will be cut off. It's Psalm 37, 22. His blessed ones, his accursed ones. Rabbi Mayer said, anyone who blesses Israel is considered as if he is blessing the divine presence. And he gets it from that verse, but I don't necessarily understand how. 
But anyone who blesses Israel is considered as if he's blessing the, the divine presence. So we're there, Shekhinah, it's the Shekhinah, the divine presence, the dwelling presence of God that dwelt in the tabernacle, in the first temple. Bless Israel, it's considered as if you're blessing the divine presence. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said, anyone who comes to the aid of Israel is considered as if he's come to the aid of the divine presence. As it says in Judges 5.23, Curse, cursed are its residents, for they failed to come to the aid of Hashem. These people were supposed to come out and do battle, and they didn't. Um, but not, you know, do battle for what? Do battle on, for, on behalf of the, the people of Israel. They were coming to aid the people of Israel in battle. And God doesn't need aid. God doesn't need anyone to go pick up a sword or a gun and fight for him. However, this teaches you that whoever comes to the aid of Israel is considered as if he has come to the aid of the divine presence. Rabbi Ishmael said, you find that the righteous bless their children at the time of their death. For Isaac said to Esau, I will bless you in the presence of Hashem before I die. Therefore, when Jacob became ill, Joseph took his two sons and brought them into his father so that he should bless them. It happened after these events. Next, next section. It happened after these events. Same verse, Genesis 48.1. What's written above this section? The days of Israel's death drew near. It's 47, 29. The days of Israel's death drew near, and he called for his son, for Joseph. And as, as the Midrash has said before, the reason he calls for Joseph is, is Joseph is favored by good fortune. The prophet Isaiah cries out, Isaiah 26, 20. Go, my people, come into your rooms and close your door behind you. This whole section about the day of the Lord and that day, right? The God's wrath will be poured out and his advice to his people is go come into your rooms and close the door behind you until it's passed by. The Holy One, blessed is he said, I told you that you should hide yourselves and allow place for good fortune. Navos did not allow room for another's good fortune. It's an Ashkenazi pronunciation. Navos, maybe Navos, I don't know. Do not allow room for another's good fortune, and as a result, it's written concerning him, for Naboth had been stoned and he died. This is Naboth. Naboth. Why was Naboth stoned? Remember? <laughs> Naboth was stoned because <laughs> Naboth was stoned because he had a really nice vineyard, and uh, Jezebel wanted it. And she went and cried and cried about how much she wanted the vineyard. And Naboth says, I ain't giving you my vineyard. And they killed him. <laughs> the interesting thing here is, is what the Midrash is saying. The Midrash is saying, Midrash is, God says, I told you, you should hide yourselves and allow a place for good fortune. In other words, if for whatever reason someone else is the person with power someone else is the person with wealth that's again it's third week in a row the midrash is reiterating in judaism if someone's powerful or wealthy it's because they're lucky it's not because they deserve it necessarily god says make room for those people you can't fight these people they'll they'll steamroll you you can't there's nothing you can do to these people naboth didn't give up his vineyard he didn't make room for jezebel to enjoy her day in the sun and as a result, he was stoned. Now, this is a completely different take. Because normally when we read that story, we think Naboth stood on principle who's following the Torah law, that you're not allowed to transfer property to another tribe. He's, he, and, um, but the Midrash here is like, well, he's dead though now. Was it, is it better to have your vineyard or, and be dead? Or is it better to stay alive and not have your vineyard? He lost the vineyard either way. And he got himself killed. This is a very practical advice to, especially to Jewish people in exile, you know, that Ferdinand and Isabella kicking you out of Spain in 1492. Well, at least you get to live, go, you know, go to Greece, go to, when the, the Sephardic diaspora went everywhere, Sephardic Jews in Bulgaria, Sephardic Jews in Italy, so they're everywhere. Uh, after getting kicked out of Spain in 1492, they survived and because they didn't fight it, they just it was like, okay, you know, and the Spanish monarchy is gone. The Jewish people are still here, right? So you'll, you, you make room for these people, these psychopaths that have all the power and money in the world, and just try to keep yourself alive. 
Hide yourselves in an odd place for good fortune. This, this whole section is extraordinary. And it, it sort of uh, turns over these stories and says these, these uh, great Bible heroes could have been a little more clever and avoided disaster. The next one, Mordecai. Mordecai, hero Mordecai, the hero, one of the heroes of the book of Esther, confronted good fortune. He should have flattered the wicked man, but because he confronted the evil Haman just a little, Israel almost perished from the world. And again, you never hear this about Mordecai. You never hear Mordecai should have bowed a little bit. And he should have, he should have uh, done something to avoid the catastrophe. He's this, he's this brave hero standing on principle. In Judaism, there's only three principles that you stake your life on. Only three principles you stake your life on. Everything else, everything else is negotiable if your life is in danger. You want to remember the three things you stake your life on in Judaism? The three cardinal sins of Judaism you will not commit even to save your life? Well, idolatry. Idolatry. Murder. Murder. And forbidden sexual relationships. So you, you, those, are the, those are three things a Jewish person cannot do. Now, there's sort of an exception to martyrdom situation where if a, like in a, like an Antiochus Epiphany situation where he says, eat pig or I'll kill you. He's trying to eradicate Judaism and the Jewish people. So in that, in that case, you, you also pick martyrdom. It's a little bit more complicated. But generally, in a normal time, uh, adultery, idolatry, and, uh, and uh, murder are three things that you can't do. But anything else, you can give up your vineyard. You don't, that's not a hill you die on. You know, you can appease this guy Haman however you can. That's not a hill to die on. Um, there's, you, you can stand on, you can stand on principle to a point, but if it's going to cost you your life, the principle is spare your life. That's the uh, nefesh is the principle in Judaism. Spare, you know, preserve life at almost all costs. There's only a few things you can't do to preserve a life. You only get one shot at this thing, you know, make it last, make it count. You have some other examples of people who did this thing correctly. It says David fled and escaped from Saul, right? David had been anointed as king, he didn't, but he didn't fight for it. He didn't go fight Saul. He fled, escaped from Saul, and he fled from Absalom, his son. These people who had more power than him temporarily, he just hid. It was, the minister says, that was the right thing to do. You know, make room for these people who have temporarily have power. And Jesus did the same thing, running around, staying away from Herod's area in Tiberias, uh, st staying away from uh, Jerusalem sometimes. You know, not always. You go for the festivals, but, you know, you didn't hang out there in the temple all the time waiting for the Sanhedrin to come get him. He would go and then he'd disappear. He'd run off uh, somewhere else for a while. He spends, he spends a lot of time sort of on the lamb. Moses, too, for us, stated Moses fled from before Pharaoh early in, uh, in Egypt, or in uh, Shemot, in uh, Exodus. He, uh, he fled from, I think that was when he killed a guy. Um, similarly, Jacob fled from Esau, right? He, he runs away. He, he doesn't stick around and fight Esau for the you know, inheritance that he won with the, or bought with the, the, the beans. He thinks he's going to kill him, and he just runs away. Even the forefathers of the world took into account another's good fortune and flattered those who were favored by destiny. And he uses the example here of Abraham when he gets to, uh, I think it's when he gets to Egypt, and says, tell everyone you're my sister, and instead of killing me to take my wife, they'll treat me well and uh, take my sister. <laughs> um you know, he's, he's, uh, it, because, and it, it says here is that Sarah, he, he became subordinate to Sarah. In other words, in this one situation, um, he, he, he doesn't, the Egyptians don't give a rip about him. They're very interested in his wife. So in that situation, his wife is the one, is the person who has the power to decide how they treat Abraham. Mm -hmm. So he's subordinate to her in that situation. So that's why he said, to say that you're my sister. And then Isaac flattered Esau. 
as it's stated in, in a Genesis 25, 28, Isaac loved Esau. The Midrash is saying it's, it's not necessarily that Isaac really favored Esau, it was his favorite kid or whatever, but he somehow prophetically foresaw, remember Esau is, Esau is uh, Rome, Esau is the, the whole, basically the whole, all of the West, Western culture. Um, Isaac prophetically foresaw that that would be the ascendant culture, the dominant power on the, on the earth and chose to flatter Esau for a time. Here too, Jacob calls for his son, Joseph. In Genesis 47, 30, let me lie with my fathers. He's wanting, he's wanting to be buried in the land of Israel. Joseph said to him, in which place? Jacob said, in the grave which I have acquired for myself. Was Jacob a grave digger? However, this teaches you that when Isaac died, Jacob said, it's possible that the wicked Esau will be interred in the burial place of the righteous. So what did he do? He brought all his silver and gold and made them into a pile. He said to Esau, what do you prefer, this pile or the burial place? Esau took the pile and Jacob took the burial cave. It was told to Joseph, your father is ill. Just we're back in Genesis 48, 1 now. It was told to Joseph, your father is ill. Who told him? Our sages of blessed memory said Ephraim told him. Because Ephraim was engaged in Torah study together with Jacob, he noticed that he was ill. Israel gathered his strength, in verse 2, and sat up in bed. Why did he sit up in bed despite being ill? Because Joseph is the second in command of all Egypt, and he's very powerful, and Israel wanted to honor him. Jacob said to Yosef, so, so on and so forth, God told, came to me at Luz and told me he was going to do all this. Stuff. I'm going to make you fruit, fruitful and numerous. And then he goes to make the sons of Joseph equal tribes with the, uh, his own children. No, verse 5, Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, just like Reuven and Shimon, Reuben and Simeon. And then in verse 8, he sees the two people he was just talking about and says, who are these? <laughs> who are these? <laughs> Rabbi Yehuda ben Shalom said, did he not recognize them? Is it, isn't it the case that every day they would have been sitting, engaging in Torah study in his presence? Now he asks, who are these? After they ministered to him for 17 years, ever since he came to Egypt, he didn't recognize them. However, he saw that Yoravom son of Nevot and Achov son of Omri were destined to descend from Ephraim. And they would be idolaters. This is Jeroboam and uh, Ahab. Jeroboam and Ahab. Remember, Jeroboam was the guy who set up golden, he set up, golden, he set up calves at Dan and Bethel. It's an alternative to going to the southern kingdom to worship at the temple. And of course, Ahab, we've all heard all about Ahab. Showdown with the prophets of Baal and all this stuff that happened with Elijah. So the divine spirit, he sees Jeroboam. He prophetically sees in the future, sees Jeroboam, the idolater, sees Ahab, the idolater, all descended from this kid, Ephraim, not a kid anymore. He sees that they're going to be idolaters. And he sees that and the divine spirit departs from him. When Joseph saw this, he immediately prostrated himself on the ground and begged for mercy before the Holy One, blessed to see. And he said, Master of the universe, if they are worthy of a blessing, do not turn me away today with embarrassment. Thereupon the Holy One, blessed to see, imbued Yaakov, Jacob, with the divine spirit again, and he was able to bless them. How do we know this? For it is written, and it's very obscure, Hosea 11.3, I sent to train Ephraim, he took them upon his arms. Basically meaning I led my spirit back to Yaakov for Ephraim's sake, back to Jacob. That, uh, your translation doesn't say anything like that for Hosea 11.3. Because um, the Hebrew, the Hebrew is difficult. Um, Rabbi Shmuel by Nachman said, at that time, the divine spirit departed from Jacob twice. This time, when he was about to bless Ephraim and saw the idolatrous descendants. And... Another time when he wished to reveal the end. We're going to get into more detail on that probably next week, maybe this week. But um, it says in, the, in, in, I think, the next chapter, he gets everyone together to because uh, he wants to tell them what's going to happen in the end of time. And he doesn't. 
the, the tradition says that the divine spirit departed from him when he was about to do that because it wasn't time for everybody to know the end yet. All right, back to Genesis 48, 14. Israel stretched out his right hand, placed it on the head of Ephraim. He began blessing them. May they multiply like fish. He informed them with this blessing that the sons of Ephraim were destined to be trapped like fish. As it is stated in um, Judges 12, 6. And he would say to him, please say, Shibolet. But he said, Shibolet. Uh, it was the shibboleth thing, right? So the idea here is that multiplying like fish, this uh, is also going to describe other attributes of fish to Ephraim. Fish do indeed multiply. And there's lots and lots of fish, but you can catch a lot of fish at one time with a net. So if they uh, if they screw up really badly, it's possible that a lot of, a lot of them might die in a short time which is what happens in Judges 12. This is Jephthah, the story of Jephthah, which I think starts in chapter 11. This war against the Ammonites, and he's a Gileadite. Remember, Gilead is over there on the east side. And he want, he don't know when, uh, no one comes to help him. He goes to the war against the Ammonites. He wins against the Ammonites, come back, comes back, sacrifices his daughter, whatever. But then the Ephraimites come and they say, we heard you went out into battle against the Ammonites and you didn't invite us. He's like, I did invite you and you didn't come. And they're like, we're going to bust your head open or something. And um, so the Gileadites go to war against the Ephraimites, another one of the many internecine conflicts, tribe against tribe that we find in Book of Judges, very, uh, you know, uneasy time, unstable time in Israel's history. And to figure out who's an Ephraimite, they have this thing where if someone's, if they see someone and can't uh, pronounce the word uh, Shibolet correctly, and they say Shibolet instead, they kill him. Killed 42,000 Ephraimites. 42,000 Ephraimites. So lots, the, the idea is all, all those fish got caught in the net. Also, uh, speech originates in the throat and the hook of, goes into a fish in the throat. Right? given away by their accent. Joseph saw his father placed his right hand on Ephraim's head and so forth. So he went to go move the hands in Genesis 48, 17. Um, Jacob said, you wish to remove my hand, which vanquished the prince of angels? I think he's talking about that time he wrestled the angel. Rabbi Yochanan said, like two pillars in the tall buildings of Tiberias, such were the arms of Jacob. Remember, these guys all have like superpowers, midrash. Joseph said to his father, no, 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 no. I was just, uh, I thought you forgot who was the firstborn. His father was like, I know. And uh, the midrash says, uh, Jacob knew Gideon was destined to be descended from Manasseh. Gideon, pretty good. Mm -hmm. However, Joshua will be descended from Ephraim, even better than Gideon. He blessed them on that day saying, through you, the children of Israel will be blessed. Uh, so people will say, may God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. We'll put Ephraim first. When was his blessing fulfilled? At the inauguration of the leaders, for Ephraim offered the sacrifices on the seventh day, and Manasseh on the eighth day. That's all happens in Exodus, I think. Somewhere in there. Numbers, maybe. I don't know. Somewhere in the, in the Torah. All right, six minutes. Yeah, we have time. Jacob called for his sons, Genesis 49.1. You're limiting you. Teach us our rabbi. Does the one who passes before the ark respond amen to the blessing of the Kohanim? The one who passes before the ark is the, like the, the person leading the service, or the cantor. And, but the cantor doesn't do all of the jobs. One of the things the cantor doesn't do is the blessing of the Kohenim. Why? Because you need Cohen to do the blessing of the Kohenim. Cohen stands up in front of the ark and spreads out his hands and says, may the Lord bless you and keep you, and so forth. If you don't have a Kohen, the cantor does this part. But you don't say amen. You say, can you hear it some? You say, may it be God's will. In other words, I hope so. I hope he does 
bless and keep us. And the Cohen says it, you just say amen. Yep, I agree. Our rabbis taught us the one who passes before the ark should not respond to men to the blessing of the Kohen. He's got other stuff to worry about. He's got to focus on getting all the prayers right, in the right order, pronouncing everything, pronouncing uh, everything correctly. Doesn't want to get confused off track. So he doesn't say amen to the priestly blessing. See how the Holy One blessed is he cherishes the one who passes before the ark. He's not required to respond to men to the Kohen. Rabbi Chonin said, when ten uh, enter the synagogue and one of them passes before the ark and recites a section of the blessing of the Shema, concerning him it states like a lily among the thorns. Song of Solomon 2.2. This is a, sort of a unique situation. He's talking about a situation where ten people, ten adult Jews, ten adult Jewish men, pray. They've been praying separately. Um, in other words, they... they uh, they have they they're not a minion. They they started praying like not together, so they haven't said uh, the parts of the prayers that are that only said with a minion, just kaddish and kedusha. If you only say it with a minion, then they are all in the synagogue there, and they maybe they see that they have a minion now. I guess I don't know. Someone gets up. And starts, they say, uh, Kaddish and Borchu. Do you ever do in a synagogue? Right before you say the Shema, there's a half Kaddish, and then there's Borchu. And you don't do either unless you have a minion. You have, you don't do Kaddish. The Kaddish is the part is amazing to be sanctified according to his will and so forth. It's a short, it's about this much in the a half Kaddish, is about this much Siddur, the article Siddur. It's not very long. And then Borchu introduces the blessings of the Shema. It's um, Baruch Hashem Mavorach, and everyone responds, Baruch Hashem Mavorach, you bow during the, um, and then the first blessing of the Shema begins. And a lot of the Shema and its blessings is set, you sit down, and you say it quietly, but the first blessing of Shema in the morning, Shacharit service, has a little like community involvement. There's a Kedusha stuck in there. Sometimes you you stand, you say, uh, you say, Kadosh, 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 Hashem, Sevaot, Malot, Arts, Kodo. You say the blessing, holy, holy, holy is the is God of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory, the, the, the thing the angels sing around the throne. <clears throat> That's sort of stuck in there in the first blessing of the Shema, it's say, or who, who created the, the luminaries, right? So well, all this is saying is someone realizes, I guess, someone realizes they got a minion. Someone just goes up the front and does Kaddish and Borku and leads everybody to Yotzer or so they can all do the Kedusha together. That guy is like a lily among the thorns. If you, you see, you've ever been to a synagogue, you know how fun it is to do Kaddish and Borku and Yotzer or together. So. And it's good. It's, it's better to have a minion to, to pray. The Holy One Blessed is He said, in the past, I had to bless my creations, as it says, and we're not going to give re references for all these, because you, 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 you remember all these, but God blessed Noah, God blessed Abraham with everything, God blessed Isaac, his son, God appears to Jacob, and he comes back from Padanaram and blesses him. But from now on, the Kohanim and the Righteous One will bless you. From where did the Kohanim merit the blessings with, with which they bless Israel? Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah said, from Isaac, because there's this little Hebrew word "ko" in the in a verse. It says we will go until that place. Ko. Um, ko can mean a lot of things. It's very versatile. Um, it when it says, "Thus shall you bless the children of Israel," in number six, teaching the priests the priestly blessing. It says, "Thus shall you bless." It's that Hebrew word "ko." Do you find another place where that? Ko is, and try to make a connection. Um, our rabbi said that the, the one you should look for is in uh, is Exodus 19.3, where it says, Ko, thus shall you say to the house of Jacob and tell to the people of Israel. This is, it's, 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 just, it's just in uh, Exodus 19, the giving of the Torah. So because of the giving of the Torah, the priests 
uh, merit to say the priestly blessing. Because if the Torah had never been given, the priests wouldn't be saying the priestly blessing. That seems self-evident. Maybe there's something else here I'm missing. All right. Next week. Next week, we'll get into Genesis 49. And all of the extraordinary, we'll probably go through all of them, all the extraordinary um, prophecies concerning the uh, 12 tribes. Mm -hmm.